Good morning, Cross Point. Good morning. Oh, it felt good to say that. All righty. Well, uh, as Pastor Brooks said, my name is Nathan, and I have the absolutely wonderful opportunity to come talk to you guys today uh, as we start a new season here at Cross Point. Um, if you've been with us for any amount of time, you've definitely heard the phrase, uh, our, our mission is to love God, grow up, and serve all. Uh, and today we're going to start a several-week process of unpacking exactly what that means, what it is, and why we believe it. Uh, so the passage that we're going to be speaking from today is uh, Colossians chapter 2. So uh, while you're opening up that, uh, if you have your Bible with you, I did want to go ahead and give you just a little bit of a context uh, for this particular passage. Because uh, I believe that context is very, very important when you're studying the Bible. Uh, it gives us a little bit more insight into what we're actually reading. Now, uh, the book of Colossians was a letter written to the Colossians uh, by a man named Paul. Now, Paul was one of the... Uh, uh, wrote a significant portion of the Bible that we read, and uh, he was writing this from prison. He was in one of his many stays in prison uh, as he was being prosecuted for uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the interesting thing to note is, as far as we know, Paul had never actually uh, been to Colossae. He had never met the Colossians, so this was a people he did not know and a church he did not start. Now, the reason he's writing to them is because he had a messenger, an informant, if you will, uh, from the church of Colossae. Now, what this messenger was telling Paul was really good things about how the Colossians were sticking to the Word of God, and they were actually doing really well. But at the same time, he was informing them of some of the societal and cultural pressures that they were facing at this moment in time. Uh, things like uh, observing and following the laws of the Torah and assimilating into a mystical polytheistic culture, which is something that we'll talk about later. But uh, Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians to encourage them to continue doing what it is that God has asked them to do, but also to challenge them to face head on the challenges that they were facing with the surrounding cultures. So, uh, if you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 8. Uh, and that reads, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So before we actually dive into this passage, I do want to uh, be the first to tell you that I am the least qualified to give you this message. Uh, as Brooke said, I am, I am 19, I fall into that category of young and dumb, and I am not 10 feet tall and bulletproof, I am 6'2 and some change and very susceptible to bullets. Uh, but I do, want that to be, I do want that to be a great reminder that God does not call the equipped, but He equips the called. And so as we spoke about earlier, I don't want a single word that I say to be heard this morning, but... Uh, that God would use me to tell you exactly what it is that he wants to be heard this morning. Because I know for sure that I can't give you anything even close to the level that God has to give to you this morning. So if you bow your head and close your eyes with me as we pray into this passage. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And I thank you for your faithfulness to the Colossians, just as the same faithfulness that uh, we see for us today. Lord, I pray that you would use this broken, unworthy vessel to share your word and your glory and, most importantly, your truth. So, Lord, as uh, we dive into this passage this morning, I pray that our minds and our hearts would be open to hear your word and that uh, it wouldn't be surface level, but, Lord, we would take it to heart and we would know exactly what it is that you want us to hear and that we would, we, we would be able to live through that. So, Lord, we pray all these things in your precious and holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we dive back into this passage, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dive straight into our first point, because uh, there is a lot uh, of information here in a very short passage. We're not going over a whole lot of uh, scripture, but there's a whole lot of information within that scripture. So our first point today uh, is to not get trapped by lies. Now, where exactly do we see this in this passage? Uh, well, in the very first portion of this passage, it reads... See to it, this is a command, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, uh, according to human tradition. Now, that word captive is the first thing I want to focus on. It's, it's an interesting word choice there. There could have been a lot of different things uh, that Paul wrote there, but he chose to use the word captive. And, and in this context, the word captive is actually referring to being carried away or kidnapped. So immediately that makes me think that the uh, person who's receiving these lies, they're not necessarily wanting to be taken captive. This isn't something that they want or desire. Uh, and I think the majority of times, this is how lies get us. 
They're not something that we want to take on. We don't see a lie out there and you see, oh, well, that lie over there looks particularly nice. I'll go ahead and deceive myself willingly. But I think it's something that um, starts slow and gradually gets worse. Uh, Because the longer you willingly involve yourself in a lie, even at the smallest level, it's going to get easier and easier for you to get swept away or carried away, uh, carried away by these lies. Now, I think the easiest way to uh, illustrate this would be through uh, something like a wave pool. I don't know if you guys have ever been in or seen a wave pool, but it's this very narrow pool that starts shallow and gets deeper, and it has these mechanically automated waves. They start really small, and then uh, over time they get so large, I wonder why they don't really have uh, several lawsuits every year, but these are really large extreme waves that people do tend to get hurt in. But if you're around a wave pool or you've never been to one, a lot of times you'll start, you'll step into it or maybe just sit around the edge with you, you know, your feet in the water and you say, oh, this is fine. It's just you know, at my ankles. I can get up, I can walk around, I can leave any time I want to. And then you, know, you take a few steps further in and well, now it's up to your waist and you say, oh, well, it's, it's a little harder to control. I mean, the waves are kind of throwing me back and forth, but I mean, I still got half my body above water. I have complete control over this situation, but eventually the waves get larger and you get a little bit further into the pool and now you're up to your chest, up to your neck, up to your chin, and you have completely lost control of the situation because now the waves are large enough that it's carried you off your feet and you are at the whim of the waves. You're being carried back and forth and you are no longer in control of the situation. You have been taken captive by these waves. Now, how often do we do this to ourselves with lies? You know, we can dance around it and we can walk around it and eventually, you know, we'll stand in a situation where we know that something is deceptive, but you say, oh, well, I'm only, I'm only this much into it. You know, it's something I control. I know what I believe and so I'm not going to let it affect me. But, you know, you stick around the situation longer and you stick around those people longer and you say, oh, well, maybe I get why they believe that, but I don't believe that. You know, I, I, I understand that they think this way, but it's not the way I think, so I'm, I'm still in control of the situation. And it still starts that way. But the longer you're there, the harder it is to say no to that, to say no to those lies, and to differentiate between what is the lie and what is the truth, and eventually you have been taken captive by those lies. Now, where do these lies come from? Well, there's lies all around us, and a lot of times they're easy to see, sometimes they're harder to see, but if we're looking at the actual context of the Scripture here, Paul is writing to the Colossians uh, who were facing two main pressures at the time, Uh, the first of which being um, the Judaizers at the time were wanting the Colossians to, yes, worship Jesus, but also to observe the laws of the Torah. Now, the Torah was uh, this these scrolls that were very sacred uh, to the Jews at that time. And uh, they were heavily focused on uh, ritualistic law. And these were all things that were done to cleanse the uh, person instead of letting Jesus cleanse them. And so, to the Colossians and to Christians now, if we're taking away what God did, that has become a false gospel because we can only rely on what God did. We cannot earn our own salvation. And so uh, the obedience to the laws of the Torah at that time was taking away from what God had done. And Paul was writing to the Colossians to uh, stray away from that, to make sure that you aren't taking that responsibility on yourself and you're not taking away from what Jesus did. And so you're still focusing on Jesus. Now, the second thing that they were facing They were also facing uh, this pressure to assimilate or move into a uh, polytheistic culture. Now, the Greek and the Roman gods at the time were still being praised by a lot of people, and uh, the culture surrounding the Colossians wanted the Colossians just to move Jesus into the category of these other gods. So, yeah, you can worship Jesus, but also all of these other ones. Now, if you're familiar with any of the commandments, those first two really have a problem with that. Uh, there's really no room for any other God except for God. And so uh, Paul is, of course, writing to lead them away from that. He wants you to keep doing what you're doing that is good, but don't take away from what God is doing by putting him in a box or taking some of that responsibility for your salvation or putting Jesus up with other gods. Now, uh, this does lead us into our second point here. But before we do that, actually, uh, as I was studying and uh, researching for this particular message, uh, I had listened to quite a few sermons, and I had one uh, particular pastor who 
said something that really stuck with me about this, uh, and he puts it into two simple equations uh, to figure out what uh, is the cultural lie and what is the truth of Jesus. And it says that uh, human tradition plus religious teaching, anything that we can conjure up, equals nothing. So really anything that we do, anything we conjure up and any traditions we have in, uh, in order to get the respect and the admiration from God is nothing. There is nothing we can do. But Jesus plus nothing else equals everything. And so if we completely forget our own traditions and what we think is worthy of God's praise and admiration and us worshiping Him, we can forget all that because Jesus is everything. He's the only thing we need. So that does lead us directly into our second point. Uh, Paul is writing to not get stuck in a broken culture. Now, what exactly does that broken culture mean? Well, obviously, we today live in a broken culture. Uh, there's brokenness all around us. Uh, it's a weird, strange, terrifying world that we live in. But, of course, the uh, cultures back then were somewhat different from ours today, but we still have some of the same concepts and ideas that we struggle with. Now, Paul was writing to the Colossians, uh, uh, specifically in this portion of the verse. He says... Uh, see to it that no one takes you captive by uh, philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, that's somewhat difficult to define. It sounds really weird, mystical, and strange. Uh, but what most commentaries land on this actually meaning uh, is it's referring to the material components of the universe. Because the, uh, it translates down to stoichia, which is the root word for our modern word, stoichiometry. It's the study of the reaction between elements. And, and so what the uh, most commentaries think this is referring to is the uh, people who still worshipped things like the sun, the moon, earth, wind, and fire, 21st night of September, uh, all these things that were easy to see. They were material uh, because, quite frankly, it was easy to worship these things. It was easy to worship the sun and the moon because you couldn't quite disappoint them, and it was really easy to make up what they were telling you to do. And so, I believe Paul is telling the Colossians, and even us today, not to worship what is easy because it's really easy for us to worship what is easy. Now, I don't think many of us still walk outside and, you know, worship the sun and the moon, but what we do is we tend to find our favorite aspects of God. What we do is we look at God and say, our God is a loving God, so I'm going to worship the loving God. Or our God is a generous God, and I'm going to love the generous God. Or our God is faithful, and I'm going to worship the faithful God. And these things are all true. He is loving. He is generous. He is faithful. He's merciful and all these wonderful things, but that's not all of God. And as soon as we start to take one aspect of God and worship that, we're still taking away from God. It's not the whole gospel. It's not everything he is. He is loving, but he is just. He is generous, but he knows what's best for you. And all these things that we think are good might have a side that we don't always see as good. So if we're only loving uh, or worshiping a loving God, what's going to happen when something happens and you don't see it as loving? Because through our broken lens of reality, we're going to see God is not being loving sometimes. And so that's going to shake your faith, and we can't jeopardize our own faith based on the fact that we want to see God as loving and only loving, or generous and only generous. So once again, we're taking away from who God is to only worship that part of Him. Now, that also leads us directly into our third and final point that Paul tells us, don't miss the mark because Christ is truth. Now we get this from the passage, uh, the part where it says, and not according to Christ. Because if we're looking at the entire passage, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive. That's a command, don't be taken captive. He wants us to not get taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. He doesn't want us to get taken captive uh, by things according to human tradition or the elemental spirits of the world but also not, uh, or things not according to Christ. So that takes it from really small things to not get taken captive by, and then he broadens it to anything that is not according to Christ. So in one phrase there, he is uh, expanding what he's talking about, but he's also narrowing it down so finite that we cannot possibly miss what he is talking about. 
because he doesn't want us to get taken captive by any of those previous things, but anything that is not according to Christ, anything that is not what he says, anything that is not his truth. And so if Christ is not the center of what we're doing, what we're talking about, what we're learning, then we are missing the mark. If Christ is not the dead center, if it's not about him, for him, and through him, we have already missed the mark. Now, I'm in my second year of college. Uh, It's been absolutely wonderful. I love college. Uh, I started my first year at Hutchinson Community College, um, and I'm in my second year at McPherson College now. I'm a communications major. I absolutely love it. But with my major, I'm in a lot of classes that are really project-oriented. Now, in my first year at Hutchinson Community College, uh, I was taking an audio production class. Once again, very, very project-oriented. And our final project was over the use of what we call a lav mic. It's actually something that I'm wearing right here right now. But the lav mic uh, has to be used in a specific way, and this final project uh, was going to be a instructional cooking video that we had to record using a lav mic. Uh, And he wasn't necessarily concerned about the video or the script or the lighting or any of those fine details. What he wanted was the use of the lav mic, and he wanted to make sure that we were using it properly. Now, I actually have an extensive vid- uh, background in video production. I done it, I've done it for a really long time. It's something that I really enjoy doing. And so as soon as I figured out that our final project is a video, I immediately started thinking about, okay, well, what kind of set am I gonna use? What's my script gonna look like? What are, uh, what's my lighting gonna be like? And that's really what I focused on. And then time came around to actually do the project and I set up my set and I got the lighting just right. I uh, used a really nice mic that I had at home and I uh, recorded this with the nicest camera I had and then I spent hours working on it after filming. I spent uh, two all-nighters and several hours in between classes working on this project, making the video look as nice as possible with fun text and transitions and effects and it looked great. As I was still kind of getting used to uh, college and college assignments, there weren't a whole lot of things that I was really proud to turn in, but this was one of the things that I was proud to turn in. I could not wait for him to grade it. Now, when I got the uh, results back, I got an F on that assignment. Any idea as to why I got an F on that assignment? That is exactly right. The one thing that I was supposed to do, the entire purpose of this assignment, the one thing that it centered around, I completely left out. At the expense of making the video look so nice and the audio sounding so good, it was an audio production class. I could not understand why he was upset with the audio. It was as good as I had ever made it. But the one thing that was required was not there. And so it didn't matter how good the uh, video looked, it didn't matter how good my script was or how good the lighting was, what kind of editing I had that he didn't even teach, the thing that he needed was not there. And so it was all worthless. Church, no matter how good we make our weekend services look, no matter how good the worship looks on screen, no matter how good we can present ourselves to the community, if Christ is not the center of it, if he is not there, it is worthless. Nothing that we can do can make anything in accordance to God if he is not there. If what we are doing is not centered around him, if it's not for him, if it's not about him, if it's not through him, then what we are doing is not worth it. It is a lie and we will get taken captive by it. We will get swept away into this culture where we have to make things look nice, things have to sound nice, we have to look good to the people around us so we can get people in the doors, but it's not going to matter if we get people in the doors if Christ is not the center of what we're doing. So we have to be able to identify what is the truth and what is a lie. Because if we're willingly involving ourselves in these lies, we're going to get swept away and Christ will no longer be the center of what we're doing. So how, as a church, do we come to the point where we can differentiate between what is the truth and what is a lie? Now, uh, this may have been something that you've heard before, but uh, the FBI uses some interesting tactics to figure out what is counterfeit money. You can, for all intents and purposes, call this lie money now. So this, uh, these agents, they don't look at counterfeit money and identify what is the markings of a counterfeit uh, dollar bill. What they do is they become so familiar with real money that whenever they're handed counterfeit money, they don't exactly know what it is that's wrong, but there is something that is wrong. And so they know counterfeit money because they know real money so well. 
So if we as a church, if we as a culture, if we as Christ followers want to be able to identify what is a lie, we don't go out and we research what lies are there out there? What are these false ideologies that people are subscribing to? So I know to stay away from them. What we do is we become so focused and so knowledgeable about Christ and His truth that we are able to identify things that are not Christ-centered. Now, there are a lot of truths about God. There are a lot of uh, true things about who God is and what He does, but I think the one thing that we have to remember, the one truth, the capital T truth, is that God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son down to become one of us, to live with us, to live a perfect life, so that one day He would die on a cross for us, for our sins, our shame, and for all of us through all of eternity. And on the third day, he would rise again, proving that he could and did beat hell, death, and the grave on our behalf so that we could spend eternity with Christ in heaven. Church, if you see anything, no matter where it is, if you see anything that deviates from that or goes against that, that is a lie and it will take you captive. That is something that we are called to not only turn away from, but we are to run far away from. Paul is encouraging the Colossians to look towards the truth and only the truth. He tells us that we cannot get taken captive by these lies, lies that we produce ourselves or the lies that we encounter in our culture. He tells us that uh, we cannot get stuck in this broken culture because, church, our culture is broken, and I don't see it getting better anytime soon, but it's our job to not miss the mark because Christ is the truth. If we remember that, if we remember those simple things, then we are able to identify what is the truth and what is a lie. And we can live in accordance to Christ. And we can do exactly what it is that he wants us to do because we have the opportunity to live in a nice culture. We have the opportunity to make an impact on the culture around us. And things can look nice. Earlier when Paul was talking about the human traditions, there are good traditions. I don't want you to see that as all of the traditions are bad because they're for us. There are good traditions. But we have to remember that Christ is the center of them, or it's not worth it. So, church, as we close out today, I did want to give you a little bit of homework. Sorry, I'm still in school. It's a regular part of my life, so now it's a part of yours. I want you to take a look at some things that we do, whether it's in your own personal life or whether it's at church. If you think that, yeah, I'm doing this for God... I really want you to look at it. Are you doing this talking about God or maybe even thinking about God, but is it really for you? I want you to make sure that Christ is actually the center of the traditions that we carry and we keep. And maybe we'll find some things that don't necessarily need to stop happening, but we just need to reshift our focus so that we're not missing the mark and that Christ is still the center of it. So as we remember that, I will encourage you to uh, think about those things as we go throughout our week, but I'd like to close this out in prayer. So if you bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Lord, I thank you for your truth. Uh, I thank you that our truth is not to be relied upon and that you don't call us to do so. Lord, you have given us the truth and you've given us your word so that we can live according to you and we don't have to take that responsibility for ourselves. Lord, you've already done everything necessary. All we have to do is follow you. Lord, I pray that we remember these things and that we are able to live according to your word and to your calling as we go through this week. And Lord, let us be able to see the lies in our life and help us not to get carried away. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name.